Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome into the studio. Today we will be casting the torso of Empyrean in plaster. It's the first time we've done a large plaster cast here on the channel. Plaster is cheap, easy to work with and readily available anywhere in the world. At least I think so. I'll talk more about how this came about later in the video. All things considered, plaster is fairly straightforward. You mix the powder into the liquid, never the other way around, slowly sift it in to avoid lumps. If you get lumps, you'll be forced to stir, which will in turn cause air bubbles and a weak, or in the case of the splash coat here, poor plaster. I'm clearly a touch too impatient for all the waiting, however, so that's perhaps something to improve upon in the future. The tools will be apparent as we go along here. Notice the nice dark green bowl, for example, that I'm using. This is a plaster bowl, a bowl made specifically for plaster. And they're rare to come by. I'll include a link in the description below to where I buy mine. The other tools you'll see here in the beginning are a spatula and a simple humble brush. The plaster is mixed and to get it into the mold fast, I dump a bunch from my bowl into the mold. I don't let it set up like this, however. I want the splash coat to capture detail and be as even in thickness as possible. Even thickness minimizes potential warping or instability issues caused by a thick section of plaster, causing the whole torso to not balance properly. I use this pool of plaster inside my mold as a reservoir. It's a little less messy, actually, than continually dipping my brush in and out of the bowl. I simply brush the plaster around, getting an even thickness and popping any air bubbles trapped on the surface of the mold, hopefully. Because I'm a bit neurotic and because I didn't really have time to make mistakes here, I went super safe and made another splash coat. This is probably not very necessary, but I did it anyways. The final cast didn't turn out very heavy at all, so it certainly didn't seem to be a mistake to do so either, and probably something I will repeat in the future. One thing this second splash coat allowed me to do was to thicken up the edges a bit. The edges are always the weakest and require some extra love if they are to hold up properly. I also try between layers to clean up the edge of the mold as best as I can. It's preferable if the silicone edges, responsible for a clean registration and a non-existent seam, to be clean so the two halves go back together without any plaster crumbs getting in the way. A metal spatula and a brush to dust away the debris does the trick. I reinforce my plaster with burlap, or ute, depending on where you are in the world. Pre-cutting the burlap before starting applying it saves time, it's less stressful and keeps the scissor handles from getting completely gummed up with plaster, which makes them very painful to handle. More plaster is then mixed. Before applying the burlap, I brush on a little wet plaster onto the old dry plaster. This helps slow down the moisture escaping the plaster-infused burlap into the old plaster. If this happens too fast, the two won't stick together very well, which is a shame. The whole point of the burlap is to stick and to reinforce the cast. Burlap is straightforward and easy to work with. I take one and dip it into the plaster, making sure it's soaked before squeezing most of the plaster back out again. It's not the plaster that makes the cast strong. Too much plaster makes the cast very heavy, but the plaster is needed for the burlap to stick. So remember the plaster is there for a reason, but don't use too much of it. If you don't use it at all, you'll have a cast filled with dry fabric, which is really of no use to anyone. I put the burlap down in the mold up to the edge of the silicone, but not over it. Perhaps a finger's thickness away from the edge just to be safe. Then I lightly tamp it down to make sure there's no air trapped between the burlap and the plaster splash coat. A light touch is required here as a heavy hand can break the splash coat. Now I'm not really sure what to do if that happens, which leaves me even more sure it's something you probably want to avoid. 
the next piece gets overlapped with the first one. So every piece of burlap is not only stuck to the inside of the mold, but to each other as well. This is very important for the mold to be as strong as it possibly can. On a big mold like this, we can use big pieces of burlap. The size of the burlap doesn't really matter actually, as long as you're able to lay them down and eliminate all the air bubbles between the burlap and the splash coat. Some areas like inside the head will require smaller pieces to make the process easier. So it's a good idea to cut a few different sizes of burlap just to save yourself from having to, to cut while the plaster is setting up. This brings me to why I am making this cast. One of my former instructors at the Florence Academy of Art, Sanne van Tongeren, opened her own studio in her hometown Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I visited and helped her teach a few days last April, and because some of her students know me and she needed a casting of a torso for them to copy, she asked if she could use my torso. I mean, the torso I sculpted. And I was of course thrilled and said yes. It's always lovely when someone finds your work worthy and the idea of spreading the work, my work, around the world is very enticing and satisfying. So thank you, Sane. Without you, I certainly would not have made this cast or this video. I hope your students enjoy working from the torso. All things considered, burlap is very straightforward. It's the inside of the cast, so it doesn't have to be pretty, it just needs to work. Overlap every piece of burlap and make sure you stay a finger's width away from the edge of the mold. Let's take a moment to thank today's sponsors, my Patreon supporters on Patreon, who have ensured the continued existence of this channel and allowed me to upgrade my gear bit by bit, making better looking and better sounding content for all of you to watch. If you are interested in supporting the channel or perhaps interested in getting personal feedback on your sculptures from me, then my Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes. We can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out. There's a link in the description below. And again, thank you so much to those of you who have given generously and supported me. It, it really means the world. A second layer of burlap is applied in very much the same way to ensure proper strength and everlasting property. Once the burlap is in, the mold is ready to be closed. But just as a precaution, I decided to reinforce the edge a little bit extra. There's no burlap on the edge, only splash coat. Because if the burlap gets over the edge, it's a huge hassle to cut it down and, and rasp it down. The burlap kind of frays and, and it turns into a giant mess really, really fast. It's not like fiberglass, which is easy to, to cut and rasp down. Plaster, however, is easily shaped to rasp. Now, if you can imagine when the two halves of the mold closes, I'll need to get my brush with plaster on it onto the edge to fill the seam. So a plaster edge coming 90 degrees out from the edge of my silicone is not desirable because I can't get my brush in there, right? Instead, I want something closer to a 45 degree angle away from the silicone edge. This ensures the edge is plenty strong and I'll be able to get my brush onto the seam once the mold is closed. And wherever I fail at making perfect 45 degree angle, I can rasp it and file it later. To prepare the mold for closing, I clean all the edges properly and rasp excess plaster down to keep it from interfering with the closing of the mold. In general, any piece of plaster protruding higher than the edge of the silicone would, will need to be rasped down. There are exceptions in complex molds or molds with strange shapes, but this has or is neither. So I can follow the easy, the easy simple rule here. <laughs> 
One important note about these open silicone edge molds. The silicone edge can be squeezed and deformed if you strap the bungee cords too tightly together. You want them to be tight, of course, but not so tight that it deforms where the two halves of the mold meet. Now, if you were doing a closed edge mold, if the edges of the mother mold were touching each other instead of the edges of the silicone touching each other, you wouldn't have to worry about this as the hard shell of the mother mold obviously can't be deformed. Well, I mean, it could, but it would break before it deforms. There are pros and cons to both methods. I prefer the open edged mold seen here as it allows me to properly inspect and see if the silicone of the two halves of my mold have registered together properly. You cannot see this if the edges of the silicone is closed behind the mother mold. A brush gets rid of most of the fallen debris while wet paper towel cleans the last little bit. Wet paper towel makes short work of plaster debris. I let the mold sit overnight so the plaster hardens up the maximum amount. Actually, it would take more than one day for the maximum amount of hardening, but one day is all I have and one day is enough. So it's the next day and it's time to close the mold. Placing a hand on the inside keeps the silicone skin from falling out with your beautifully crafted half of a cast. The registration cut into the silicone should mean the two halves come together like butter. Uh, but they didn't do that this time. I seem to have been a little overzealous with my burlap, building it too high in the area where the head meets the raised arm. Which means I'm back to where I was yesterday, to rasping, cutting and filing. And I think I cut my finger here as well. With a little work, the two halves fit perfectly together. Almost. This took a couple of tries to get right actually, but thanks to movie magic, those were cut out. There's a little gap you can see, but it's tiny and the bungee cords will pull the mold together even further and some reworking of the seam is always to be expected anyways. Now we have the two halves strapped together. We need now to connect the two halves of the cast on the inside. So they'll stay together forever, even when the mold is open. When plaster dries, it craves moisture. It's deprived of moisture. When the only moisture it gets is from wet, fresh plaster, it'll suck it out so quickly that the wet plaster will turn into powder almost instantly, doing very little good. So a good trick is to douse the dry plaster with water before applying fresh plaster. This cast is at this point in the video only one day old, so just a little spray is enough, but you could potentially leave your plaster cast in a bucket for a few hours to make sure it's soaked. Fresh plaster is then brushed onto the seam, filling up those two 45 degree angles running along edges of both halves of the mold. As the plaster slowly sets and becomes thicker, kind of like cream cheese, I use it to fill the gap further to make it easier for the burlap to lay down inside the mold. Let's take a moment to thank today's sponsors, my Patreon supporters on Patreon, who have ensured the continued existence of this channel and allowed me to upgrade my gear bit by bit, making better looking and better sounding content for all of you to watch. If you are interested in supporting the channel, or perhaps interested in getting personal feedback on your sculptures from me, then my Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. 
And again, thank you so much to those of you who have given generously and supported me. It, it really means the world. I can't get burlap everywhere inside the mold, but wherever I can, I do. The burlap is what's going to hold the two halves together, locking them together permanently. One layer with some overlap is usually enough to achieve a permanent bond. So it's time for the most exciting part of mold making, which is of course opening the mold. First off, off with the bungee cords. Then off with the model mold. As you can see, I have a piece of foam that I can lay the piece down on so it doesn't lay straight on the hard table. A pillow or something similar can also be used. I know from experience, making the mold and casting in it before, that the silicone on the back should come off first. There's nothing potentially holding this piece on, so there's no risk when taking the back off. And with the back off, I have a better visual access to the front, which does have parts which could be damaged when removing the silicone. One such thing that could be damaged is the ear and that's the one thing that I'm most worried about. It's thin, it's fragile, it'll break easily on me, and it's not so easy to fix once it breaks. So I start off with releasing the ear carefully. Silicone stretches and flexes, so I can pull it slightly to get it around and off the ear. And once it's off, I'm kind of safe. With the ear loose, I can be a little bit more reckless, even though I'm not very reckless at all, actually. I prefer to pull silicone covering heads from the top of the head towards the bottom. This helps release the nostrils, the brows, and the eyes. Pulling upwards can cause the nostrils to break, or something in the eye to break. And perhaps the worst case scenario is that the silicone skin could get caught on the chin and the entire head could break off which is of course not very likely, but it could happen. With the face released, the rest of the silicone comes off no problem. Notice how I instantly put the silicone back into the mother mold. Silicone skins will warp and distort on you if you leave them laying around. So the easy solution is to always keep them in their mother molds. All children belong with their mother after all. As I already mentioned, there are always seams to fix. At least when I make molds. Well, not always, but often enough there seems to be seams to be fixed. The seam this time is fairly simple to fix. There's just a bit of a gap in some places, which can easily be filled. Fixing seams become very hard when the two halves are offset, creating a step between the front and the back. As long as you can avoid this by following the way that I've described to you in this video, you should be fine. A little seam work is good for the soul anyways. With all the work out of the way, this piece is ready for its new home in Amsterdam. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. And awfully soon, by November 7th actually, there will be exclusive sculpting content on my Patreon.
The first series we are embarking on is the beginner's guide to sculpting the figure. I'm super excited to finally be creating exclusive content for my Patreon. And I hope you'll be too and we'll take a look. The link to the Patreon page is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. It helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.